All right. Um, okay, so my name's Louis, um, and um, I'm presenting a paper that I wrote for my master thesis here at OCAP and supervised by Dr. Park. Um, it's not as exciting as K pop. It's actually quite boring, most of my presentation will be. Uh, and, and if I don't finish, feel free to cut me off. Like most things I address in my presentations, a lot of issues are unconcluded, so, so can my presentation be. Anyway, so um, this is the title, as you can see. Um, and I just want to start uh, my pre presentation by turning the focus on the event that took place in 1914, uh, named Komogata Maru. Um, it was a ship that carried 376 passengers. It departed um, May 23rd, 1914, from Hong Kong to Vancouver. Most of the passengers on board were Punjabi workers, originally from British India. As a commemoration of the event, well, let me see if, yeah, sorry. Um, what happened was, um, the ship was denied entry to uh, Victoria Harbour in Vancouver. Um, due to two main policies, the Immigration Act of 1910 and the continuous journey um, that was included in the um, uh, legal document in 1908. Um, there were, so the con continuous journey was a policy that required all immigrants who came from specifically Asiatic regions to carry at least $200 at arrival, which is about 4,400 Canadian today. Um, these were the two policies that, um, that were in effect at the time. Uh, and the one on the left is the um, con um, Continuous Journey Regulation. The one on the right is the Immigration Act of 1910. Okay, so as, com as commemoration of this incident, a event called In the Wake of Komogono Maru was organized in the Surrey Art Gallery in Vancouver in 2014. And a symposium was followed afterwards uh, where five films were streamed and played and my research uh, specifically focused on uh, two of the films, John Grayson, Richard Fun, and Ali Kazimi's Rats vs. Sin and Vivek Shoraya's single, Seeking Single White Male. Now, um, just to make the presentation quick, um, because it's a master's thesis, I can't really go into details in a 15 minute presentation. Um, but this, this study deploys a multidisciplinary mode of inquiry and um, combining policy and legal studies, race studies, gender and sexuality studies, migration studies, and media studies. The two films that I'll be talking about reflect the historical, social, political, and cultural issues and norms that impacted. Uh, rights of marginalized South Asian immigrants and stigmatized their sexual beings and choice. The overarching framework uh, follows uh, Louis, French philosopher Louis Althusser's theorization of uh, repressive state apparatus, apparatuses and ideological apparatuses, which I'll explain shortly. Um, by using this, um, theory, this theory, uh, it aims to demonstrate the shifting mechanisms of racial and sexual repression of the brown, of the brown bodies from a historical point when the Komagata Maru happened to contemporary Canada, uh, which the second video by Vivek Shura will address. Um, in addition, we identify ambiguity as a key element for understanding racialized sexual repression and how it has only shifted its form from the forceful, which is the repressive, uh, and external means such as immigration policy, restrictions on owning property, which led to urban segregation in Vancouver um, in the early 20th century to a more ideological and internalized mode of repression through white normativity in, con in the contemporary society. Now, this research addresses not only the issues of racism, but also its perplexing, perplexing intersection with non-normative sexualities. Now, I don't think I have time to go through differential consciousness. Um, however, I do want to focus at least on one film. Uh, the the Rux vs. Sin was commissioned by Vancouver Queer Film Festival in 2008. And uh, this film primarily explores the, the legal trial between the Su Supreme Court of Vancouver and two South Asian Sikh men, Dalip and Nana Singh, 
who were living in Vancouver in 1915 when they were both arrested by Italian-Canadian undercover detective uh, Joseph Ritchie and detective Donald Sinclair for alleged sodomy. The film reconstructs the case of legal dispute, dispute based on court transcripts recorded during the first 20 year period of the 20th century when a large number of Sikh men living in Vancouver were detained for the same reasons. At large, the film portrays the incessant anti-Asian sentiment in Vancouver uh, that not only reflected but also informed the repression of South Asian immigrants at the time. The arrest of Sikh men exemplifies the modes of control that the state deploys through immigration regulations, the gross indecency laws that essentially criminalize homosexuality that was used to, to prosecute, uh, well, I've said that already, uh, also policing and um, urban segregation. These are the repressive, so to speak, external means of control and repression. Um, now, just to give a quick um, explanation for the theory. Um, so, for Louis Althusser, on the one hand, repressive state apparatuses functions massively and predominantly by repression, while uh, functionally secondarily by ideology. Uh, on the other hand, ideological state apparatuses function predominantly through ideologies such as family, church, school, uh, even media, and secondarily by repression. Um, in the case of in the case of um, Rex versus Sin, uh, repress, uh, repressive state apparatuses uh, came into play a, 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 a little bit stronger uh, through policies, uh, law, urban segregation, um, and uh, policing. Now, um, in specific, the case of Rex versus Sin that was um, that this film really tries to um, tackle on through four different montages um, deals specifically with the continu continuous journey policy that was directly also related to the, to the Komagata Maru event. Um, uh, in that the passengers did not, as long as the passengers did not directly come from uh, their country of origin, so in this case the Punjabi workers did not directly come from uh, British India, however, they boarded the ship from Hong Kong, which essentially faulted their right to come into Canada. Um, the uh, policy also, uh, this is, okay, I'll get to this in a bit. The gross indecency law was applied to Naina and Dalip Singh, who were arrested, and its, its application and definition was rather ambiguous and mostly used for racial repression. Um, the Canadian government again, uh, criminalized homosexuality from 1890 to 1969 um, through these policies in which, and I quote, deviant homosexuality was considered as deviant behaviors that needed to be stopped from spreading. Um, South Asian immigrants became the target of this law due to the hatred that existed in terms of racial differences that, as one of the um, historians in the film argued that at the same time, also fascinated the white sexual imagination. Of course, simultaneously threatened their homophobic self-identity. Um, so second point, ambiguities are embedded in how these policies are defined and applied. For the continuous journey regulation, it only stated that it had to be applied to immigrants from Asiatic region without explicitly calling out South Asians. Such ambigu ambiguity was important because technically speaking, Indian immigrants at the time should be protected by, as British subjects. However, um, that, of course, protection was very vague and almost empty. And a side note, the Chinese and the Japanese were sub subjected, subjected to other policy, as some of you may know already. Um, and uh, in terms of Korean immigrants, I don't think, uh, I think the first wave of Korean immigrants didn't come to Canada until 1966 yeah, or something. Yeah, 1960, we are very late. Very late, uh, and they came as, um, I think, Christian missionaries. Yeah, yeah. So at, during that time, the um, Koreans were not, not part of the picture. Yeah. And then there was seg urban segregation. Just to use a quick quote, uh, it's Ingram, the guy uh, in the film, said that Carroll Street in Vancouver was the original line between the so-called white city behind it and the oriental city on the other side. 
and those apartheid-like lines shifted every five to ten years and often resulted in a riot. Now, policing, uh, uh, policing exemplifies the intertwining of the repressive state apparatuses and the ideological apparatuses. Namely, homophobia as an ideology required repressive criminalization and policing to imp implement it as reality. The police also function by ideology both to ensure the um, cohesion with and production of the values they propound externally, but arresting homosexual subjects Sorry, something popped up. But arresting homosexual subjects, the police became agents of the law, not only to, where is it? Okay. Not only re to repress homosexuality, but also to force subjects to internalize an ideology that through fear and punishment will serve as a method to stop homosexuality from spreading. Now, um, how am I doing with time? Five minutes. Um, I think I should jump to the quickly jump to the second oh, film. Just narrative, just what is the actual film is about, and that's perhaps enough to provoke questions. Right. I think. Yeah. So a quick overview. The film uh, was it's divided to four independent montages. The first one is this classical um, courtroom drama resembling uh, a. The, uh, uh, resembling Billy Wilder's witness for prosecution that was made in 1957. And the first montage was made collectively by Ali Kazimi, John Grayson, and Richard Fum. And the second montage, Ali Kazimi uses this conventional interview format with Gordon Ingram, the guy you just saw, um, who is also the commentator which provi who provided historical context for the case of Rex versus Sim. And John Grayson, in the third montage, uh, uses cinematic fantasy parodying the court narrative using the, the elephant and the pocket as metaphors to confront the contested relationship between, between the police and the accused. In the fourth montage by Richard Fum, um, he reconstructs the narrative through B-roll images of archival documents and dialogues in the, in the same but, not, but now empty courtroom from the first montage. Some of the pictures so given the final, final verdict of, a, of the case is unknown, um, and the allegation was unresolved, uh, one set of ambiguity can be seen through the potential fascination um, and the fear of the police. Uh, sorry, one, one set of ambiguities can be seen, which is the potential fascination and fear of the police towards the, the arrested Sikh workers. So these are just some of the stills uh, from uh, the film. Um, Grayson used this elephant as the, the elephant um, uh, metaphor uh, to address these ambiguities and the idea that knowledge, um, isolated knowing, isolated knowledge of, will never produce truth. The same way that in the court case, it's what he says versus what he says. So um, the sexual uh, innuendos. Um, are present uh, throughout this third montage as well. Um, I don't have time to go into the, what the elephant parable is. You can Google that um, yourself if you're interested. No, okay, so the second film, uh, Seeking Single White Male by Vivek Shura. It's a short performance video and that was produced in 2010. Uh, this, he, she produced the video before her transition into a woman. Uh, so what Shura did was to juxtapose gay bar comments that she received or overheard in the video uh, with photographs, photographs of herself embarking on a transition to whiteness with blonde hair and blue contact lenses. Um, I do want to address that whiteness in this case, in a con at least in the context of this work, will, is different from when we talk about whiteness in the context of East Asia. Um, uh, anyway, so video runs two minutes and 20 seconds long, in, in which the transformation is presented through gradual showcasing of nine sequential photographs of herself in various stage, stages of changing into and back from whiteness. Uh, the viewers are presented with the photograph first, and then the text will come later. Um, so what the lingering text um, 
confront and um, provoke the audience to think about what is at stake in this seemingly volunt voluntary incorporation of the racializing and sexualizing imperatives in, it, in these comments. Shoria urges the viewer to really think about how desire for specific physical attributes is constructed as internalized ideologies that have been translated into one, someone's into one's sexual desirability and un undesirability. To consolidate both film, okay, I don't have time to go into Chella Sandoval. I'm just going to quickly conclude then. Yeah, I think we can stop there and yeah. ask more questions about the more details. Um, Perfect. Okay, so. Oh, yep. sorry. This actually uh, research is going to be published within a month, is it? Yeah. Yeah, this is, as you can read it, um, and very intriguing analysis of two media work one documentary, another one is performance videos. and. The penetrating theme is white normativity, how racism worked in the past, and how racism through the more invisible form works in the gay community, queer community, in Canada as well as elsewhere. This story of white normativity within uh, queer community has been taboo and is coming out right now. And even somebody written a Wikipedia article, which we shared, uh, what was the title like? Racism within queer community or something like that? Across the world. Across the world. Or question, please. Any questions? To condense just the two questions, please. And I'm going to move on that. Any questions? I think he condensed a lot, so I'm sure it was a little bit of a... Yes? I got asked that question a lot. Um, I essentially was trying to do research on the exclusion of Chinese immigrants in, China, uh, in Canada, and then I um, got really fascinated by this event, this notorious event that happened in 1914. However, since I barely seen academic work talking about it. And then so I went to look at some of the films that were uh, played at the event. I realized I found this connection specifically focusing on the exclusion of South Asian movement. Asian immigrants, and I thought this would be a great way to contrast and compare how South Asian immigrants were uh, marginalized and repressed in historical contexts, and how they are continuous, continue how they how they are being repressed and marginalized in the contemporary society. So that's how I chose these two films. In the context of sort of the notion of white Canada, which was which broke out, in fact, in 1950, because more and more immigrants were coming from Asiatic reason, according to the already mainstream previous Euro, um, Euro American immigrants. And they had a fear, ethnic as well as economic fear. The Chinese are coming, the Asian are coming. So that's the beginning of yellow uh, fairy in Canadian history, which is unspoken, untold histories, which is severe experience of Vancouver, but not much talked about, according to the Vancouver correspondent. And uh, yeah, it's coming up right now. So any more questions? One more questions? Yeah. Oh, um, I was just wondering where it's going to be published. Uh, so, uh, Journal of mm -hmm. Ethnic and Cultural Studies. OK, and then also yeah. a second quick question. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, because I know Richard Fong is based in Toronto, and yeah. the other is also in Toronto a lot. Yeah. I was wondering mm -hmm. if you know if they've ever been in conversation about these works together. Um, not that I know of. Have you ever tried to reach him? I have, right? unfortunately, after I finished the thesis, because it was such a power. Um, I, I was too afraid to contact them. But yes, I contacted them afterwards and sent them the manuscript as well. you never met Shuraya though? No, but I just felt to her.
Everybody. My name is Florence. Uh, I am a master's student in, in interdisciplinary art, media, and design uh, at OCAD University. Um, I'm just finishing up my first year, and uh, this is the preemptive title for my thesis, Bad Forgeries Make for Good Originals. Um, and so when I talk about forgeries, I'm mostly developing upon the idea of Jack Halberstam's uh, productive value of failure. Um, and I use this as a queer feminist lens on Cantonese Canadian diasporic issues in my visual arts practice. Uh, from the racialized imperative for success to the limiting definitions of cultural authenticity, I, hypoth I hypothesize that failure as a subject and method in text-based art offers alternatives to systems of power while opening up reclam reclamatory potential for my own identity. Um, so this first piece is Something I've been reworking a lot in my personal practice. Uh, it's in, been involved in like performances and been changing as time goes on. Um, the inside piece is actually from a performance I did with a fellow master's student, Joshua Luchi Kong. Um, and uh, yes, text based art. Um, since the mid-20th century, the social positioning of East Asians in North America has shifted towards the model minority. So this new racialized narrative created the category of the good minority that achieved upward mobility by virtue of hard work and integration and um, weaponized as a success story and a stereotype against themselves as well as other minorities. Our newfound citizenship was conditional upon assimilationist respectability politics of patriotism, neoliberalism, and normative white middle class femininity, masculinity, and sexuality. Um, so given this model minority form formulation for Cantonese Canadians, uh, queerness and failure, or queerness as failure, are inherently political and subversive to hegemonic power structures. Um, I think of a lot the example that Haberstam gives of the inability to live up to heteronormative and patriarchal ideals can be liberating without the shame attached to it. Uh, and so I think a lot about losing, undoing, forgetting, and many of these other floating diasporic feelings uh, as a way of processing through um, some intergenerational issues of displacement, assimilation, and loss. Um, this is from a series I made during a residency at the John and Maggie Mitchell Art Gallery last summer in Edmonton. Um, there are a series of 12 scrolls, I suppose, um, that hang labyrinth, thing, like a labyrinth, uh, so you can walk through them and they kind of gently sway as you go around. Um, I was thinking a lot, uh, not only like, I too talk about Orientalism in my work, but um, I think a lot of the fact that I could not escape having made very self-orientalizing work during my undergrad when it was quite impossible to avoid um, using easily readable, easily digestible, and easily legible uh, symbols like dragons and gold and red and all of that uh, to kind of um, make more sense to the normative crowd that was seeing my work. Uh, I did, well, I grew up in Montreal. I just moved out here a few months ago. Um, and uh, I'll talk about that a little bit more later. 
Um, I also like to play a lot with uh, text as a signifier of other things that we recognize fonts now as specific to uh, certain applications, uh, Microsoft Word, processing, writing, um, and here of course the red underlining for mistakes uh, put underneath um, a name that I don't really put in many documents, um, my Cantonese name. And uh, I think also the fact that not only could I now uh, stop kind of catering to um, this kind of like white expectation of what my work should look like, but also that um, I think these subjects are not something that we want to admit sometimes to people outside of our community because it's not like safe to talk about it with them and it's not something they can really contribute to it either way as a conversation. Um, so I think this was uh, a much needed turning point in my work to make it both more personal, more accessible, and perhaps discussing what my professor once called community secrets. Um, right, so I make text-based art, uh, but also I have a specific attachment to it as um, I have a, I don't know, particular history with language, I suppose. Uh, since I grew up in Montreal, um, my first or second or third language is French. I'm not too sure where to put it. Um, that and uh, Cantonese is a very important part of my life as trying to speak more to my grandmother and um, basically gaining all of my knowledge and family history from her has been really uh, influential in turning how I treat my own self and my own culture in my work. Uh, détournement is basically the word in French for derailing. Um, Détournement and dérive are both strategies used uh, in the later 20th century by a group called the Situationnistes International, who were mostly um, a European group who um, used strategies that Jenny Holzer and um, Barbara Kruger would use in basically appropriating uh, or reappropriating the space and language of uh, advertising. So. Uh, the clear fonts and extremely eye-catching, readable uh, phrasing, um, short and mostly furtive, so not some, not a place where you would really expect to encounter art or encounter critical engagement. Um, and so my text space, the Tulema, has always been uh, influenced by autobiographical or autoethnographic material. Um, that then becomes like deconstructed into uh, its materiality, the fragments, symbols, text, image, etc. Uh, and then reconstructed through what I call self-imposed purposeful alienation. Um, I think as people of color in the diaspora, we're very like used to the idea of alienation being a negative thing um, in kind of this elusive search for maybe an inappropriate kind of belonging. Uh, but that uh, this non-familiarity can really be a, a productive space of finding uh, new ways of relating rather than, um, I guess, for some, the goal being to belong into kind of an assimilationist narrative of I too am Canadian, I too speak French and English, um, that there are also alternatives to that, but also that those are not um, truly like the goals of living on this land. Um, this is more of my recent work. Uh, thinking also about labor a lot, I hand embroider absolutely everything. Um, and so even these pieces were actually hand embroidered um, and they're quite large. Um, but I also think of the idea of repetition and what that has meant for me. And I think that when I think about it, it's perhaps more that, um, uh, well, my grandmother was actually a seamstress and she, my dad tried really hard not to teach me how to sew so that I wouldn't end up <laughs> like my grandmother. Uh, and I am here 
still sewing inside a building whose uh, keystone says new textile building. Uh, that's where we are right now. <laughs> and um, yeah, I mean, these are very common experiences probably for a lot of people, but um, yeah. Um, there's a kind of unspoken joke between most visual artists that once you've made a neon piece, you've made it. Uh, <laughs> and these are not neon. Um, they're just LED wires glued with like hockey tape and hot glue. Um, and they hang in my studio now and it's probably the cheapest thing I've ever made. But um, also still thinking about how uh, success is a big, well financial success, but also assimilationist success is like a big indicator for a lot of immigrants and their children of how well, uh, how well they've done, I suppose, in their life. Um, and that despite the fact that my family has basically achieved all of that, like there's still a very empty feeling of, um, you know, what has happened to uh, our language and the kind of rift between the communication I can or can't have between myself and my grandparents and other relatives, um, and really just like within myself too. This is something my father used to, well, he still says that. Um, I work hard so you don't have to, is something that I've heard a lot uh, growing up. And I think this intersection of class and race is something that's slightly uh, ignored in like academic discourse sometimes. Um, I think it's really important to talk about like the kind of expectations that kind of live within a person even after um, something has been apparently achieved. Uh, this was a found comforter that I got at Value Village and I don't know if it's very apparent but there are a lot of stains on them. Um, yeah, also hand embroidered, took a while. This is my most recent installation for a personal exhibition I just put up called Please Reply. Um, I've been thinking a lot about thesis writing, and so my work has become about thesis writing. Um, if it's not apparent, the first line, the fake title of this fake essay is, I wrote in my grant that this was supposed to be healing. Uh, I think a lot about how shirk culture, grant writing culture has changed the intention with which we make things uh, and that, you know, trauma, especially for queer people of color, can become like performative and something that is to be like consumed by an audience, but also something that makes you more or less worth this amount of money. Um, and if this works, I'd like to watch it. Oh, there's no sound. It's all good. Yeah. Oh, wait, sorry. It is playing here. How do I do this? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. I just have to try to go. No?
that's it. Um, I only have a video of the first one for now. Uh, but these essays are basically all embroidered. Uh, they are made of mostly organza and cotton voile. Um, and Yeah, specifically in this installation, uh, I put them very low on plinths and uh, with cushions underneath them so that you have to kneel to kind of go through them. And they're also paired with uh, some white gloves so that there's a more, I guess, um, cautious approach to them. Uh, the second, I made three essays. The second was called, You Honor Them in a Language They Do Not Speak. Uh, this is more thinking about my thesis in the fact that I talk a lot about my grandmother and to my grandmother, but I don't think she understands my practice. <laughs> she kind of just has, you know, that like, oh, that's so sweet kind of <laughs> um, reaction to my work uh, most of the time. And uh, yeah, I think a lot about what it means to involve community in your work. Um, what it means to be working for a community. Uh, and I'm really glad I'm in Toronto for this, for many reasons. Um, and I'll just wrap up with this last project uh, that I did in collaboration with um, Joshua again. Second Funeral, which was uh, coming out of our uh, first visit to the ROM, um, which has a very large Chinese architecture collection, uh, most of which is a like funerary procession and like tomb. Um, so we thought a lot about how memory is evoked differently for institutions. In this institution, it is to not use the objects, not use the table, um, and have it basically be uh, like an object that goes through a second death if it was actually meant to be used um, to uh, evoke memory and to be somewhere for people to come and pray to, what does it mean for a place uh, to then be stripped of that access and ability. And so we took some pictures of stuff at the ROM, um, some of the architecture, but also some of the institutional architecture, um, and also Toronto's open air burning policy, uh, which basically says that uh, all open fires will be extinguished. Um, so I was thinking a lot of how these uh, cultural practices are both legally not sanctioned by the city and then also culturally not sanctioned by your family. And so there's a very like clear route to how this disappears, I suppose. Um, but they are actual things that we've burnt. And so that has been part of a performance uh, that Joshua and I have been doing. And yes. And um, I have an exhibition on right now if you'd like to see more of my work. It's at uh, A-Space uh, in 401 Richmond in the vitrines. Um, it's called Myself Between Others, and I'll just finish by reading our didactic. Uh, Diaspora relies on an un unwarranted nostalgia. Through our absorption of a secondhand culture, we are told stories and given objects that have meanings that are sometimes attached to a place that we've never known. This false sense of nostalgia operates differently between members of the community and members outside of that community. The objects are in constant negotiation between their status as comforts of the so-called homeland and meaningless commodification. Uh, my artworks trace the transformation of diaspora Cantonese signifiers into kitsch, as well as their site-specific histories. Um, as the A-space windows appear between a commercial vitrine, a plexiglass box, they blur the lines of these art objects between fetishes for middle-class mantles, objects othered by their traditional appearance in galleries, and contemporary art objects. Challenging the essentialist boundaries of authenticity around the lived experience of culture, the work mimics private and public spaces, questioning belonging in our daily cultivations of nostalgia. Thank you. Yeah, it does. <laughs> All right. Question. I think Hit me. Have condensed and condensed and two questions. Oh my Sorry. Gosh. That's okay. <laughs> two <have to> questions. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I really enjoyed your work. I thought it was very.
very interesting. Thank you. Um, I was hoping if you could explain more on um, text HTML. Like, I was thinking of like SI's uh, HTML, so um, I can't remember what the artist is, but something about the spectacle and how to separate the spectacle. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you could explain more on how your text Oh my gosh, yes. Uh, right, so the dilemma also comes from uh, kind of leeches off of the Société de Spectacle um, from Guy Debord, who may or may not be French or Québécois. It's probably French. Um, French. But okay, fine. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, the idea of spectacle is also something I've been trying to get rid of in my work, or something I've been negotiating with, um, because obviously art is something you gaze upon, but I have been thinking a lot about the transition I've been making from looking to reading and that looking does have that history of the white male gaze to it, but that reading has that too, but to a different extent, but also if you know my voice, you can hear it when you read it in your mind, but even if you don't know my voice, there is something in your mind that personifies the work, whereas I think when you look, there is that spectacle of potential like fetishizing and exoticism um, that kind of objectifies artwork in some ways. And so, yeah. <laughs> so you think that takes space for what you move yourself from the spectacle that gives the work more meaning or like it takes on a different layer? Yeah, and I definitely don't think it removes all spectacle, but um, I don't think that's possible. But it definitely shifts perhaps um, signifiers to uh, something else. Like, uh, I don't like chopstick font or stuff like that. That also like produces spectacle. Um, and uh, yeah, that's mostly why most of my work is uh, black and white, really gray and transparent, <laughs> barely visible. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I wanted to comment um, um, that I I have to say I identify with a couple of things that you've heard in your family, such as um, the sewing one, where your family tried to tell you, no, don't sew, don't even bother learning. Uh, <laughs> Mom is right here, and, uh, and I have to say, I, <laughs> she said, uh, you're being very rebellious. Of course, it was a joke. Um, and then the other one was um, the blanket with, I work so hard, so you don't have to. And that one also really resonated with me. So I was wondering if you would talk more about your textile choice, um, in particular, why the blanket? I'm, I'm not sure if I, if I caught that. But also, what considerations do you take? Because you do, take, you do um, have a lot of textile work. So uh, not just the, the look of it, but uh, perhaps the, the material, like, uh, itself, cotton or uh, all those kind of more formal uh, considerations? Um, well, this one in particular was because I wanted to find something that was um, used, I guess, already. Uh, yeah, the, if you might have heard of like Duchamp's The Ready Made, mm -hmm. I quite like oh. the, no, but I like the idea of the ready used. Um, <laughs> So something that is both lived with and already prepared so that there's a, there's a living memory to where it comes from. And I think when people see that, it, it changes their um, relationship to the work, uh, that they can tell when something's brand new and hasn't been lived with yet. So that's one thing. Um, a comforter also because I was thinking about uh, like things that are supposed to, like comfort a child, but also um, be like the foundations of like relationships and families, I suppose. Um, but this is like an installation that I've kept changing every time I've presented it, so there's more to see. Uh, and, that. sorry? I understand now. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. And the rest is just organza because it's transparent. Um, yeah. Okay, we have a lot of time. Yeah, I know we want to one more question if you have anyone. All right. Thanks a lot. Yes. Next presenter is one child.
policy to two-chart policy is going to be a very interesting uh, presentation again. Um, Okay, don't worry, please, let's do that. Um, just, uh, let's. Damn, it's good, I think it's, uh, where is the presentation here, use your yeah. So hi everyone, uh, my name is Yu Jia Xuan, I also go with the name Jade. Um, uh, my presentation is on the population slash um, birth planning policy in China. Uh, this presentation is actually uh, under a larger project that I intend to do in the next few years, uh, which is relating to um, the birth planning policies in China and particularly on the transition from one child policy um, to two child policy. Um, but this, um, this um, uh, presentation generally primarily focus on uh, one child policy and its historic background. Population's reproductive rights. That's pretty invasive, um, and to and that this kind of control was the actual goal, and not so much to stunt um, or control the actual population growth. Perhaps that 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 may have been a secondary um, uh, goal, where especially since um, there are known risks to um, to the. Um, so this kind of policy where uh, the, um, the outcomes are almost foreseen. The, the, um, like when, when males are favored, you will get a disproportionate amount of females being aborted and um, male favorites. And that this, um, it's easy to see that in, in the long run, this, um, this creates, uh, this uneven population uh, distribution uh, creates larger problems. I was wondering if you talk about that at all. Yeah, uh, so thank you for the question. Um, actually, uh, my research was intended to touch upon that part, which is the uh, problems uh, that the two-child policy faced when, there, when the one-child policy was uplifted. Um, and uh, so upon one of the points that you just mentioned, uh, the um, an intrusion of reproductive rights of women, uh, it is very interesting because uh, such kind of perspective is very widely accepted in the West. But when Western feminists, they go into China and sort of preach these ideas, nobody accepts it. Like nobody see it as intrusion of their reproductive rights. Why? It's because reproduction that giving birth to child in China is never, never being a matter for the woman. It's never, because like China is not integrated with the society. Uh, most of the, the social activities, they were all carried out in a collective term. And the family and the extended family are the basic units of society, not instead of individual um, per people. So when they talk about giving birth, it's not just about woman and a man, um, he, uh, you know, her, her partner, that you know, they want to have a kid. It's usually from their perspective, from the you know, a local resident's perspective, they are talking about carrying on the family lineage you know, carry on the, 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 the you know, offspring of the entire family. So this kind of rhetoric is obviously, um, you know, acceptable in the West, but it loses its, its explanatory, and, you know, and, and its charisma in, in China's case. 
I'm not necessarily saying that uh, these kind of criticism or like this kind of concern is not pro is not you know pro you know is skeptical of every kind. But what my concern is, for at least in this research, research is that you know I'm trying to um, my focus is on the people who actually. Concert are involved in the project and are who are impacted by the project because it's really easy to to stand on the moral high ground and say, oh, this is you know, um, you know, very pathetic. It's not. It's wrong. It's coercive. It's violent. But what if the people, if the people on the ground they they see otherwise, well, they have another story, another rhetoric, another narrative to provide that. I think it's, pardon me, but I think it's a bit like ignored to make that assumption that you know. Uh, people on the ground are the victims, and they don't have agencies, and they don't have their own story for explanation. This just touched on a very, very in important debate and discussion cross-culturally, and I have something to say, but let me ask you, do you have any more questions? Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, so like we spoke about it in um, your class as well, but um, it's unintended kind of like positive that's come out of it is that like there's a lot of like female empowerment in China now and like um, we, we discussed in class about how I'd say like uh, like Chinese women are the most empowered and then it's Koreans and then Japanese at least for East Asia um, yeah Jumping on day seems like as if yeah I'm responsible for certain uh, <laughs> ideas that are yeah two actually it's a very um, convoluted conversations but let me just to say just echoing what you have said in terms of the clash between two different paradigms of thought right how impressive is that it's not like harassment against women and then deprive the woman's agency when government involved in that level of privacy and things like that. But then her response was, well, there's a different discourses on the ground, the way that population understand those policy differently from the way that perhaps the outsider understand it. What I understand based on my own her experience is when countries that are currently in China are in a way still in the, in the position to, in a way, sacrify their own individual liberty for the good of the collective which was a situation I recall in the 1670s in Korea, my parents' like population had precisely the same mindset. So they were ready to make a contribution if possible, if it is, let's say, good for the collective. Because that time populations uh, were really expanding because they, people didn't know birth control back in the 1670s. Country was not very affluent. So there was this campaign from the government that if you bear more than three, you want to be poor. And that propaganda worked voluntarily based on consent, policy based on consent. So that I imagine is very, and so it's seemingly majority understand in China that way. Now the Chinese woman agency issues. Uh, within the China, Korea, Japan, there's interesting different dimension in terms of how this traditional industry influenced by Confucians, which is notoriously hierarchical, men are primary and women are secondary. But only China, China, thanks to the uh, communism and also this applied to Confucianism long before Korea did. And so, in a way, that Chinese women tend to have a very different dynamic in terms of gender relations to, let's say, Korean woman and Japanese woman. And once I did a survey, and this is actually official, okay? <laughs> in terms of gender equality, Japanese are currently on, on low, unlike what you think, it's the lowest uh, status. Korea in the middle, and China is slightly more advanced. So that's kind of interesting dimension. If we have plenty of time, let's open another forum on gender issue. That would be interesting, yeah. All right, so let's move on to uh, Tanya. Thanks a lot. Ooh, professional category. Uh, person who actually is um, running a space. We aim to return the computer just five minutes before. OK, I'm really happy I'm last because this is so not my element. <laughs> I like, made the presentation in the back. Um, oh, so, I think it's in the background, is it? Hania, Chinatown here. Yeah, I'm glad I don't have to actually do like a full presentation. Um, some of us are academics, 
Some of us are doers. Some of us are both. I'm definitely not an academic or a researcher. So I'm, I know this, the title of this talk was super hefty, but it's, it's going to be really disappointing. And I just want to really set our bar really low here, okay? Um, so I don't even go here. I'm the professional. Um, hey, thanks. Um, I opened um, a community art space in Chinatown Center with some friends four months ago. And even though I grew up in Chinatown and when my parents first immigrated here, they only went to Chinatown, I have never learned so much about Chinatown than I have in the last four months. So I'm also new about like learning about Chinatown and all that stuff. So um, yeah, I don't, know that, I don't know that much about Chinatown. <laughs> I have that note right here. Okay, um, so T-Base, we turned four months old yesterday, super cute. Um, we're in Chinatown Center. Do you guys know where Chinatown Center is? It's like the other mall that's south of Dundas. <laughs> it's not the mall that's at Dundas and Spadina, it's the other mall. Um, and we're in the basement, we're behind the stage. We, so it was originally an ice cream Vietnamese bubble tea shop and it was owned by a Vietnamese couple for 20 years. And then they retired and then angry Asian feminist gang did a pop-up shop in the ice cream shop during the Toronto Art Book Fair. And one of the other co-owners, John, he was asked to be on a panel for at the pop-up. And I was there and we were like, oh my God, this space is so cute. Who's the real estate agent, blah, 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 blah. And then we hooked up with the real estate agent, saw the space, and we signed the lease like the day we saw it and had no idea what we were doing. Like it's not like this was like a five-year business plan. I don't think we even have a business plan to be honest. We just kind of saw it and we're like, oh my God, this is amazing. Um, yeah, T-Base. So we're called T-Base. And this is our space. Um, yeah, so that's where we are if you ever want to come see us. And yes, yeah, so we signed the lease um, in October, in September, and then we accidentally threw a music festival in October, and then we renovated for two months and officially opened in January. This is a photo from Mahjong Mondays, which is like one of our most successful events. We just play Mahjong with the diaspora. We, got, we started with one table and one set, and now we have four tables and four sets. And no one ever knows how to play. We never play with the we never play with the compass, and we never gamble, so it's legal. So what do we do? Uh, we sell local literature. Uh, we sell local tea. We have in-house programming, um, but our main like source of income is space rental. So if you have an idea and you have like a hundred bucks, you should totally support our space. So oh. Um, so let's talk about Chinatown West, less about, less about T-Base, more about Chinatown, because that's what this talk's supposed to be about. Um, so Chinatown was originally where like Nathan Phillips Square is, and it was started by uh, a dude. <laughs> Me laughing at how little I know. Um, so, and then it got moved to Chinatown West, we're going to talk about Chinatown West. Um, back in its heyday, like everyone went to Chinatown, this, this is the same place. This is Chinatown Center now. That was Chinatown Center in 1980. This is Chinatown Center. They, and then they tore it down and made this place, the mall in 1995. And there was this comment on the site. Um, so yeah, back in the heyday, everyone went to Chinatown. If you immigrated from China, you went to Chinatown. There were associations for literally every last name you could think of. Um, but nowadays, there's like ethno burbs, so there's like North York, Scarborough, Markham, and a lot of the population now is there. There's around, um, I think there's like five, like 500, 600,000 Chinese people in Toronto. Um, and there is still a pop, like Chinatown is still hustling, bustling. Like Chinatown West will, I think, continue to be what it is. Chinatown East is, is, is really sad. There's like an A&W on the corner now. Um, but... Gentrification in Chinatown is happening. Uh, it's multi-layered, like, uh, you know, like this one's pretty bad. So it used to be like a Jewish uh, lyceum and then it became the Bright Pearl and like five restaurants have occupied that. And then it recently became this ugly building and they only have one food dog 
And this is us, me and my friends. We protested um, this like art washing show that they did um, to like this art washing like real estate ad. And um, yeah, Chinatown's changing. Uh, that's I don't like this one. That's just gentrification. It's really ugly. And there's only one food dog. And like, that's really bad. <laughs> it's apparently also the most haunted building in Canada. Um, but <laughs> Chinatown's changing. Uh, there's, they're building at, right at College in Dundas, they're building all these uh, like student housings. So there's going to be like 20,000 international Chinese students in Chinatown. Most of Chinatown, the people who used to go to Chinatown, don't even live in Chinatown anymore. Um, and there's a lot of seniors. So it's like, okay, well, like, what's going to happen to Chinatown? Um, so. Okay. Show the all the images you put and you can continue talking. Oh, totally. So Amy Lam and Su Ying went to Philadelphia and attended a uh, Chinatown Against Displacement conference. And in that conference, they decided to create a coast-to-coast -coast Chinatown solidarity network. And these are their core values. And my presentation was going to be like reading the, the values and then saying how like T-Base reflects that. But like we don't have time. So, but these are it. Let me let me paraphrase. Um, so yeah, Chinatown is amidst a cultural war, and uh, sometimes I don't know if T base. Like I'm kind of conflicted. Like, are we by nature of being in the mall, like gentrifying the mall? Like I feel like sometimes like we are art washing it, but we're also not because like my mom used to work there. I grew up in Chinatown. I don't know. That's confusing. Um, Working class, yeah, we make it working class. Uh, what did I write? We have students, we have local businesses, we work with local communities and associations. We believe housing is a human right. That's more of a like that's a more of an issue in other Chinatowns. It's not so much of an issue in our Chinatown. Um, and also, we do line acknowledgments at the beginning of every event. Um, public services are human rights. So we all of our events are pay what you can. They're all ages. You don't have to buy anything to hang out. Um, and we really embrace like human connection. We're trying to bring that back. Um, five, yeah. So I mean, Asians hang out with each other. That's not a new thing. <laughs> but for me, like, I think T base is about like, okay, let's get Asians who also care about like housing rights and capitalism and racism and sexism and how do we, how do I, how do we collect ourselves in order to amplify these voices and add to the movement? Because I feel like we're very apathetic. We've never really dealt with too much shit, so we haven't had to organize too much. Personally, I mean, we could talk about that. Um, we seek to dismantle the patriarchy. Okay, so 69% of our followers on Instagram are women, whatever. And I'm a, I, I, I'm a more femme, you know. Um, yeah, like we're really women-based. So, I mean, yeah, sorry. Um, we recognize our role as settlers on Turtle Island. We aim to work at solidarity. Like ultimately, we're like climate change is gonna fuck us over. <laughs> so like that's really like the big one, you know what I mean? And we should, we're trying to take the lead of indigenous people and just like organize for that. Cause like by 2050, I'm pretty sure we're all gonna die. So that's my talk. <laughs> Come to T Base. Uh, follow us on Instagram. It's T E A dot Base. Okay. Yeah, I'm like so not like an academic. This is so funny. <laughs> Doing a presentation like this. You guys have any questions? <laughs> um, yeah, I'm really curious because T Base went in right after the Toronto Art Fest Charter yeah. that you were talking about, and you were talking a little bit about art washing too. Mm -hmm. And I know you said you don't know that much about Chinatown, but I'm wondering if you do know about like any history of like art events in Chinatown Center? Because the Toronto Art Book Fair was really the first big thing I ever saw happen there. Mm -hmm. Well, I oh man, this mall—it's like this mall could be a reality TV show. <laughs> the amount of like management issues and like the history of this mall, because there's like four different property managements in this one mall. There's one for the residential apartment building. There's one for the hotel. There's one for the second and third floor. There's one for the basement, and there's one for the parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> And management recently changed over. Like, there's been a lot of tea. There's this one guy who was just like embezzling money and like not doing anything, just kind of sitting there. The new management has come in, so I feel like it has a lot to do with the old management. Also, I feel like um, they did a lot of like East Asian Chinese events. So, like, always on Lunar New Year's, not too much intersecting with like the other communities, because it is so close to Kensington and Queen Street West. And this mall is 
virtually empty. Like if you ever walk through it, it's like there's a lot of vacant stalls. And it's like, sometimes I'm like, okay, T-Base is art washing it, but like, they want that? Like when you talk to the people who run the mall, they're like, yeah, we kind of need business. Like ultimately money talks and it's like, it's a conflicting issue. Yeah. So I think the Toronto Art Folk Fair was the most like visibly public art thing for since a long time. time as if China, modern China still looks like that, but it doesn't. They're, um, modern Chinese cities are high tech and sophisticated and I wonder if that push towards the modern and towards that change is perhaps not, um, you know, uh, whitewashing or the white man coming in and taking over, um, that perhaps that if you know, I don't know, I'm asking, if perhaps that push towards a more sophisticated modern environment actually comes from a more um, demanding um, middle class con Chinese consumer of, uh, hey, let's catch up with the times because I don't even remember China being like this stuck in time. Totally. Um, I don't know. I depends for me. I would say it depends on like who the developer is, who owns the building, who's making the money. Like if it's a Chinese dude that did that to that building, I guess I could, you know, like I feel a little more at ease about it. Um, but I guess it's more about like Chinatown, like yeah, I guess it being um, exploited and like performative about like it's, it is just chi it's Chinatown, you know. Um, and then all these developers and like white people move in and people with money and they kind of glorify this like Chineseness about it. To sell property or to make money, and it's yeah, it's whack. Yeah, that's that's exactly what I uh, what I was what I was asking is is it is that glorification of old and Chinese? Is that coming from inside or outside? And perhaps the modern Chinese uh, actually wants an update. So is the update coming from inside or outside the culture? I think it's probably both. <laughs> Isn't that it? Obviously, the developers are white. Obviously, <laughs> obviously, because they wouldn't have removed the second food down. I don't know what happened to it, but I like they're idiots. That's like the worst luck. It's already haunted. You know what I mean? Now it's not even protected. Yeah, we're gonna come back and she just 
finish her defense through CICP, and I was examiner, and I thought this is going to be an amazing item. And so I invited her, and she writes about hyphenated identity, yeah? Living in between. So, anyways, um, thank you very much for coming and enjoying and enjoying everything. It seems like you really enjoyed it, huh? No? <laughs> Thanks a lot. And yeah, please, uh, uh, anyone who haven't filled the form yet. Yeah. And uh, so for the presenter, we, uh, we have a, a dinner, paid dinner, 